Thank you very much, Jonathan. And thank you very much, um, Vivian, as well. I had the pleasure of um, presenting a workshop at the Challenging um, Behavior Foundation. And the day started with a parent's story. And it is so, so powerful and so important for us to all be reminded that all that we're doing is grounded in providing services and the, and the people who we're providing services for, those individuals. Um, Carl and I are going to sort of take a, 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 a step back from that. Um, those of you um, who've read through all of your pre-conference stuff will see that we're down for um, presenting a, or putting together a, a workshop. Um, but we were asked by Mohammed and Jonathan instead to put together a presentation. Um, and we thought we'd take the opportunity to um, highlight some of the, the, the challenges that are facing us. And Jonathan has already, um, um, sort of in his introduction, touched on many of these. So we're going to sort of, Carl and I are hoping to sort of flesh some of them out in a little bit more detail. They're probably not going to be new to anyone um, because they've been talked about, they've been talked about on the PBS chat and so on. Um, but we just thought it would be a good opportunity to sort of tackle some of these head on and perhaps get some of your views as well. Um, that said, um, I'm also sort of slightly disappointed to lose the opportunity to be doing the workshop and getting your views because this is all about you. You're the people who are putting this in place and it's really, really important for, for those of us who are sort of working on this thing about trying to, trying to take this forward and trying to get to roll PBS out. Uh, that you're involved in that process. So um, I'm going to be describing sort of towards the end of the presentation some work that I'm involved in, and I would welcome you all to get in touch with me and to participate in that. Um, just just for, for our benefit, just as sort of a start off, how many of you in the audience are um, positive behavior support practitioners? Can I just have a show of hands? I'd say a handful of you. How many of you are would describe yourself of those sort of as behavior analysts? Okay, a few. <laughs> uh, learning disability nurses? A lot of learning disability nurses. Speech and language therapists? Occupational therapists? Clinical psychologists? And how many of you are here to sort of learn about PBS? Loads of you. Even those of you who are practicing are here to learn about PBS. Great. Okay. Well, we're here to talk about translating theory into practice and next steps in developing a shared understanding <coughs> for PBS for the UK. How does that work? We might also have called this facing up to elephants, but we'll talk a little bit about those later. Um, first, a bit of context, and, and none of this will be sort of um, new for many of you. But I think it's just helpful to be reminded that most recent government policy um, continues to build on the model of care outlined in the Mansell Report of 2007. Added to that, we've got the transformation program that was set out in um, Transforming Care, a national response to Winterview, um, View Winterbourne View Hospital. So current um, changes in policy across health, education, and social services recognize the need of um, services to join together and focus on the needs of the individual and, really importantly, on the needs of the families as well, as Vivian has been talking about. Um, the introduction of the education, health and care plans for all individuals under 25 with special education needs or um, disabilities and the introduction of um, personal health budgets from October this year reflect these priorities. Um, added to that, local provision of services and interaction, um, sorry, inter interventions based on um, evidence-based practice are also key requirements. Now, much of the guidance specifically refers to positive behavior support, which is increasingly acknowledged as the best, best practice in the support of individuals with learning disability who are um, at risk of displaying behavior that challenges. So we've had some recent publications, including the 14 core principles published by the NHS for the commissioning of um, services. Um, in April this year, the Department of Health guidance 
on the use of positive behaviour support and the minimisation of restrictive practices was produced. Skills for care and skills for health have also produced some guidance on the commissioning of training and the use of positive behaviour support and restrictive practices. Um, the Mental Health Act Code of Practice is currently being reviewed and updated, as is um, a unified approach. And NICE is currently working on a set of guidelines for challenging behaviour, um, which are expected in 2015. Oh, my animations are not working for some reason. You should just be seeing an I love PBS. Uh, the recommended use of PBS in um, all of government, uh, all of these, these, this guidance has prompted um, a call for the clarification and, and definition of PBS appropriate to the UK health and social care system. Um, and about this time last year, um, a group of um, clinicians and academics met to discuss some concerns. Um, specifically, the first was that um, PBS is being recommended in the absence of a clear conceptual framework of understanding the occurrence of challenging behavior. And Carl's gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, the second concern was that there was no common understanding, no shared definition of um, positive behavior support. Um, and the third, probably more concerning, was that rather than representing new improved practice, PBS is simply becoming the new um, label for existing practice. So the group explored how these might be addressed um, with a view to building capacity. And so a process began. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Carl Hughes from Bangor University in Wales. Um, I'm a behaviour analyst, um, unashamedly, coming up. Um, and I was uh, invited last year by a group of senior academics and researchers who you'll probably all know to get involved in writing uh, and helping to write this um, special edition of the, the journal, which is, is here now. I think mostly I was invited because I make good tea, but um, anyway, I, I have contribute to that. So I, I essentially teach behaviour analysis or apply behaviour analysis in, in the university to master students. Some of you are in the, in the audience now, some of my ex-students uh, are here. Um, what we tried to cover in this um, special edition uh, was really trying to uh, reiterate what, what Louise was saying earlier on, is trying to provide a, a conceptual foundation for what we regard as the causes of challenging behaviour, and, and, and that's actually come up in Jonathan's talk as, as well, and, and also in Vivian in terms of thinking functionally about behaviour. Uh, uh, and um, behavioural uh, environments. <coughs> and that was covered in the, uh, the paper by uh, Richard Hastings et al in this thing. So I don't know whether you've uh, come across this special edition, but if you haven't, then you perhaps should try and get hold of it and uh, read it because there's some good stuff in there. Um, then we were talking about the, how, the, how the theory essentially provides the, the foundation of all the, all the rest to follow in terms of how we um, define and, and uh, the scope of po positive behaviour support in the UK in particular and defining the competencies to lead to um, uh, training and, and widespread um, dissemination of, of, of good practice. So I think that was the, the main um, uh, object of, of, of coming together in that group. So when we're talking about pills before the pathology, one of the, one of the worries that came out in the discussion was that actually um, what we're, we're talking about is, is defining a practice and what it should look like without the, uh, the, the preliminary step of understanding the theory behind why that would be the case or understanding the theory behind. And it's kind of an analogous really to what perhaps asking your, your, your GP giving you some pills without asking him you know, what, what's wrong. So what's, what's the, the foundation or the theory behind what's going on with that. So any solution from our perspective, and this is uh, again in the context of developing an evidence-based, any evidence-based approach will start with a coherent theory about what it is you're looking at and what your, what your issue is, and there's no difference why that should be the case with understanding human behavior. So the theory in this context is just about understanding what, what would happen and, and, and things follow from that in terms of developing competencies and developing practice and what it should look like. So um, moving on from the, the, the work that Emerson and colleagues did in perhaps the 1980s, 90s in defining what a challenging behaviour was, there was a clear social definition to challenging behaviour. And that's got 
um, a couple of implications, profound implications of how we explain uh, challenging behavior from a behavioral, from a behavioral model. Is this the right one? That's yeah? the right one. And it's really about this idea that uh, challenging behavior has clear impact, if you like, on the person um, and the environment in which, in which they live. And it's, the, it's, it's that basic foundation of the impact challenging behavior has that really starts the ball running in a very natural environment now. What would, what would logically happen if you're faced with uh, challenging behavior? So you can see at the, at the base, um, if, you've, if you've read this thing, you'll recognize this, this uh, diagram. And I don't want to take, spend too much time on it, just maybe point out the main factors in terms of our basic understanding about what happens when challenging behavior occurs in, in, a, in an environment and the implications for that for people who challenge and the services that uh, are built around those, those people. Um, so this idea that this is uh, a core uh, starting, but it leads to very quickly um, uh, thinking about vulnerabilities, the maintaining processes, and the impact that this has. So if we think about vulnerabilities, we can class them basically into biological uh, variabilities, so genetics, um, physical health, perhaps you might be called. But also within this model that we're uh, proposing, very high, high uh, um, focus on uh, psychosocial impact and the, and the, uh, the causal attributions of that in, in, in maintaining challenging behavior. So we might be talking about negative life events or restricted environments, uh, very poor social contact um, and those kinds of things and poor communication environments that would lead to um, starting challenging behavior or the, the onset of challenging behavior. But the most important thing for us in a, in a sense is, is uh, starting to think about this as a system that is interrelated. So the fact that somebody challenges is an impact on the system that leads then to the likelihood that this cycle will, will continue. In other words, the fact that they challenge means that they're probably going to be more socially isolated and they're going to have less uh, uh, examples of, or less uh, opportunities to communicate with others and, and that cycle goes on. So understanding this as a system rather than a simplistic causal model. And then when we talk about maintaining processes, the point point that we're trying to make in the, in the, in the article Hastings et al. was trying to make is that other people's behavior is, is really key to maintaining that challenging behavior. So I talk to lots of uh, colleagues in, in the psychology department in Bangor and they talk a lot, a lot about things like irrational human behavior and rational behavior is quite common now in cognitive psychology talk about human irrationality. And in some ways that's the wrong question. What we need to think is what is the function of behavior. Behavior can always be described as rational or irrational but actually the, the, the real issue is whether it's functional. In, in that environment. I think J Jonathan pointed that out earlier on <coughs> in, in that sense. But the other people's uh, behavior is, is really the key to this uh, process. So you might all be very familiar with this idea of this um, uh, ABCs, but actually it's a, it's a lot more complex and inter interrelated than, than it often seems in this very linear diagram. And I think that's what we're trying to get across in that diagram, that is an interrelated process. But it's always about the function. And what we can talk about function is, what, what does function mean in this sense? Well, it means the purpose of the behavior. What's the purpose of the behavior? Uh, what's, the, what's the purpose of, uh, what's the motivation behind that behavior? We could talk about it in a more simplistic, simplistic way. Than that. And I, I have a, a lot of colleagues who are speech and language therapists, and they talk about behavior as being a communication, and I like that. It's saying these things. Uh, it's saying these things, I'm in pain, please talk to me. I need help with this. I'm bored and I have nothing to do. I want that. So when I talk to my students, at a very basic level, there are three motivators for human behavior. Things I want, people I want, and getting away from things I don't want. And that's it. And that's you and I and people who challenge. It's not, it, they're the motivators for what we do and why we do them. And that's covered by those simple communication. Um, and this is just to emphasize then that in terms of understanding people's behavior, one of the key maintaining factors within challenging behavior is perhaps the attitude of others to challenging behavior. So if we, ha if we believe that it's an irrational behavior, uh, it's wrong, um, this person has just been nasty, um, then it has a certain impact on how we might deal with that. But if we believe that the behavior is functional and it's gaining a natural human motivation, the same as all of our motivations, <coughs> then the behavior can becomes something different. It becomes understandable, if that, if that makes any sense to you. So um, I've, I've kind of briefly gone over the model, but uh, you know, read 
read the uh, article uh, by Hastings et al. if you want more detail about that, but that was kind of the, the basic model. I'm handing over back to Louise, I think, yeah. So the, as Carl said, the second paper in the edition um, addresses the issue of, of, provides a definition of positive behavior support um, by um, Gore and colleagues. And what um, Nick um, was trying to achieve was to, to, to put together a definition that um, aims to reflect research and um, current practice um, and also service structures in the UK. So multiple definitions of PBS exist, um, so, and I, but I don't think that anything that's in here necessarily conflicts with anything that you may have read from Carr or Dunlap or Lavinia um, et al. Um, so it's, it's consistent, um, but as I say, trying to sort of find something that actually brings together the way that we work here. Um, they, they suggest that PBS may be implemented in at least three main ways. So on a case-by-case -case basis, perhaps as it would by a single practitioner working with an individual. Um, professional teams um, using where different professionals contribute to different aspects of service provision. Or systems-wide approaches um, with varying um, levels of, of intensity <coughs> on a sort of tiered model. Um, covering whole, either whole organizations or whole geographic areas. And I think that from looking at the program for today, you're going to see lots of examples of all of these. Um, they may also, PBS may also be implemented in a range of settings um, or supporting um, individuals with a variety of needs. The key to all of this is that whatever setting and however implemented, Gore et al. identify um, 10 core dimensions that differentiate PBS from other approaches. Um, they consider them as a set, a set of 10 overlapping elements that can be divided into values, theory and evidence base, and process. Now, I don't have time today to sort of go into the detail of that. It's all there in, in their article and the the, the rationale for including all of these. I think for me, the key point that I want to sort of bring across is that this is not a menu of options. Um, each of those 10 components, they argue, is necessary and none are sufficient. So you can't just cherry pick them, they all need to be there together. And also, it's not a hierarchy. So no one component is more important than another. Okay. So, we come to the first elephant. The primary use of ABA to assess and support behavior change. I'm going to pass it over. Oh, sorry. No, I'm not. I'm going to. I'm no, I'm not. I'm going to continue talking. There appears to be much debate um, about the relationship between PBS and ABA, uh, so much so that in the UK um, there's what Dave Allen and Peter Baker have called an unnecessary and counterproductive polarization between ABA and PBS. And kind of depending on which camp you're sitting in, what your background is, where you come from, here are some sort of comments. PBS, ABA and PBS are the same. Has anybody here ever said that? PBS is ABA with values and person-centered planning added. Does that sound familiar? I do PBS, but I wouldn't charge, I'm sorry, I wouldn't touch ABA with a barge pole. Or PBS is a three-day course designed to make people feel good about what they do with no real understanding. Carl. I think I know who said the last one. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, one of the things that we didn't flag up actually in this talk, so I kind of surprised you at this, is I'm going to give you a crash course in what I understand to be behavior analysis and um, why, I'm, why I'm one of those people in the top sort of right corner of saying that I think PPS and ABA are the same thing, but and that's my opinion. 
So this is our definition of uh, behavior analysis when we talk to our students, and I apologize to the students in the audience who've probably seen these slides a million times, but um, the application of behavior analysis is a values-driven, person-centered, evidence-based, effective use of principles of learning to help people achieve their full potential. Now, why wouldn't you want to do that? Is there anything in there we didn't like? Um, a fundamental concept that I think might be at the root of some of the misunderstandings of, uh, of behavior analysis. Um, what do we mean by behavior? You must know what it means because you do positive behavior support and you know what behavior, you, you must understand what that means. Well, perhaps we don't understand what that means, but we should understand the, the terms that we're using if we're gonna be using um, these terms. So what do we mean by behavior? Anything that's observable? Good, thank you. Anyone else? See, he's been on a behavior analysis course. <laughs> You see how we <laughs> Do you see how we teach them to talk? Okay. Everything we do. Okay? So behavior analysis has an extremely broad definition for <coughs> the word behavior and it doesn't map on necessarily to the the uh, the lay term behavior that we use in, in everyday work. So our technical term for behavior is everything we do and that is everything we do. Everything, every process that we do. So it doesn't mean observable behaviors, it means the stuff that's going on inside as well, because actually we do stuff. You're sitting there now, not moving, but I'm assuming you're doing stuff. You're thinking, what is this guy talking about? That's doing stuff. So everything, thinking, language, believing, valuing, I put valuing in there because I'm at a PBS conference, and uh, <laughs> believing, attitudes, and moving. And some of these things are really important because it's the attitudes, perhaps, of people who work with people who challenge that might impact the way that they take that event. And again, you know, if, if they take that as a personal insult or a personal attack, then uh, their attitudes might, might uh, actually contribute to maintaining that behavior, if that, uh, if that makes any sense. But if we think about behavior functionally, um, but it's everything we do, the internal stuff as well, the thinking, uh, the speaking, the talking, <coughs> everything. It's a very broad definition, so I have to start with that because that's where most of the misunderstandings start with, with the basic definition of what we mean. Our values driven, this is what we teach our students on our course, a main commitment to empowerment, assuming ability and not disability. It was a behavior analyst back in the early days that went out and said, let's see how far we can go. If, we get to this, if this science means anything, if the science of human learning means anything, it can help people. And let's see how far it can go. Yeah? And now there are literally thousands of children with autism who are now adults who are speaking because of this technology. The use of science, of learning, that's been taken out into application. Okay, so it helped, and Viv was talking about an example earlier on that was you know, quite touching. Assuming ability and not disability, let's see how far <coughs> we can go. Positive and ethical. So the core feature is that our broad social environment actually is one of the, the key factors in facilitating our opportunities uh, in, our, in our lives. So that's what we mean. When we talk about ethical bases, this is what we teach our students. Uh, and unfortunately for them, over, <coughs> over 45 hours of contact on ethics. <coughs> now, how do you make that into 45 hours? But anyway, that's, that's what we do. We talk about benefiting others, doing no harms. And we, and we kind of really align with what the other helping professions uh, are thinking on this. Um, be truthful. And our heart, often some of that is about things like data, and that's been talked about earlier on. If we're gonna be truthful, we need to know what's actually happening. And that's why we are always pushing for valuable data collection within practice and application. Because then you can be truthful, you know what's happening, and you've got evidence that it's happening, that things are getting, getting better. So that's part of that. And pursuing excellence is this idea about how far can we go with this, um, you know, to be positive. And I think that's what I read into positive in the positive behavior support. Let's be ambitious. You know, let's go out and try and uh, see how far this can go. I know Louise is getting quite uh, nervous now because I'm not saying anything uh, uh, that I thought I was going to say at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a conversation with Louise the other day about person-centered. And we don't tend to use this so much in behavior analysis, uh, but you use it quite a lot in, P in PBS about person-centered approach. But actually, when you look at the theory of behavior and human learning, it cannot be anything other than a person-centered behavior because the behavior of an individual is unique to that individual. 
So a behavioral analysis is always about an individual, even if we're trying to affect large numbers of people. Um, so I say to my students, groups of people don't behave, even though we often describe it in that way. Individuals within those groups behave in different ways, and they might behave differently within a group than when, when they're on their own. But it's always about being person-centered, about the individual in, uh, in any meaningful. And we strive within our approach to, to be measurable, generalizable, and have meaningful outcomes. So it's things that are broadly, broadly relevant, not just to one individual, but to many individuals that are in that same situation. So that's uh, how we become person-centered. From the very start of uh, behavior analysis, we defined ourselves as, a, as an evidence-based practice. Two aspects to that in, 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 my, in my mind, evidence-based practice in terms of using scientific research, controlled research, to find out what is the best way forward that we know at this point in time. Okay? What is, what's worked? What's been shown to work? And let's use that. Let's go from where, where, we, where we are in that sense. And then the other aspect, which will be quite familiar to a lot of the helping professions, this idea of practice-based evidence. So in other words, any, <laughs> any practice that routinely uh, takes data, informs decisions about what they're doing, will be self-correcting and accountable. They will nudge themselves to the point where they are better than they were in the past. And um, that's a logical outcome from being data-led or having data as a strong aspect of your practice. So we push for that practice-based evidence approach as well. And the question is always, is this working for this person? And if it's not, change something. Do something different. Okay? Adapt. <coughs> Um, so I've been talking a little bit about, um, to my colleagues about this idea that I think this, even the question is ABA and PBS uh, different or the same is almost like a category error, in my, in my mind it is anyway. Um, so these are some statements that I think, uh, PBS, is, PBS is not more than ABA, behavior analysis in practice, that's another way of saying ABA, it's the, it's the use of the principles of human learning in a specific practice, and that might be with children with autism in an early intervention program. It might be with adults with learning disabilities and challenging behavior. Some of my students are now working in uh, high hazardous industries like construction industry and nuclear power industry to help use these principles to ensure that people do things in a safe way and people don't get hurt. That's called behavior-based safety, but it's an application of the basic principles of learning into an area, and that's why I see positive behavior support as an application of those basic principles of learning. And so positive behavior support might be a behavior analysis specifically related to challenging behavior environments uh, and the settings in which many of you might, might work. Um, but going back to the, the point uh, I made earlier about this idea that the start of this is about a coherent theory about what is happening and why it's happening. And then from that, other stuff can come. Uh, and, and, and behavior analysis in practice might look very different if it's challenging behavior or construction sites or early autism, but it's still the same thing. Learning, human learning principles being applied in a setting. Um, uh, I've kind of said this. So one of the issue, issues that uh, we talk about is this idea of, of causality in, um, in behavior analysis. And, in that model I showed earlier on the slide, we were talking about vulnerabilities as being perhaps that's the stuff that happens before or starts challenging behavior, but actually the more interesting stuff and the more powerful stuff is the stuff that maintains it, okay? And that's the consequences. Um, the consequences of our behavior are the stuff that maintains. And that's the stuff that comes after the behavior. What does the behavior get? Uh, and that's always functional in, in, in one way. So that's what I mean when I say it's, it's, it's a bit forward, but it's a lot backward. It's about the stuff that happens after the behavior that really helps us understand what's going on in, uh, in someone's life. Um, and we've developed um, a number of ways of, of doing that, a number of procedures, a number of teaching procedures, assessment procedures. Um, and uh, in our opinion, it cannot be left out of PBS or it, it becomes something else. And I don't know what that something else is. Because if that something else is about the va just the values, then I think we share the same <coughs> values. And if that stuff is about being person-centered, behavior analysis has to be person-centered, or it's not behavior analysis. Um, so I don't know where, where they differ. And I've been asking my colleagues, so what's the difference? And they can't answer me, in truth. Maybe someone here can answer me. But, uh, 
I've not had a, co a coherent answer to what are the difference. So when we talk about study of human behavior, what I think we're talking about is something like this. Uh, and this is, this is the thing that excites me the most because it has massive and powerful implications for, for real people who are having issues across all sorts of domains in, in human services. Uh, and it's this continuum between a basic science and this, this idea that it's the learning principles. We cannot step out of these learning principles. If behavior is being changed, then the learning principles are being adhered to. There's no stepping outside of them. That's it. That's all we have. Um, and these, these have been discovered in, in scientific research. But that informs applied science, which informs the service delivery. So PBS is probably a service delivery model informed by theoretical underpinnings and applied science and basic science knowledge of, of why we do what we do and under what circumstances. Um, and that is the, uh, the coherent model, in, in my view. Um, is this the last elephant? No. There's another one. There's another okay. one. This is the penultimate elephant. <laughs> so in 2003, we started, college and I started a course in Bangor uh, that teaches people to get the BACB. So it covers the content areas of the BACB, which is the Behavior Analysis Certification Board. Originally started in Florida, so it is still American-centric, if that's a word. Um, uh, <coughs> And, and their aims were really, well, I, I, I don't really want to focus on what they do in particular and what your opinions are, but I think the principles behind what they were trying to do essentially are these. That if you have, enough, if you have an approach that is grounded in a, a coherent scientific model and lots of evidence, then the next steps really are defining what people need to know in certain practice areas, um, knowing what and knowing how, training those people in a coherent model and making sure that that, that training is, is consistent so that people get the same kind of training um, and they come up with those skills. And then accrediting trainers that do that job. You know? And then the second as aspect is the regulation and protection, so certification of individuals that might practice in that area um, and quality assurance in some kind of way that people can uh, get accountability within the area. So those are the principles about no matter what you think about the BACB. I personally think it's been an amazingly positive thing for um, behavioral psychology in the, uni in, in the UK. Uh, there are now, I think, about 150 BCBAs in the UK, and back when we started the course, there were about three or four of us in, in, in the UK. Um, so whatever your opinions of the BACB, PBS has to do something like, like that. Yeah, Whether it's not that, but it's UK-specific, but it has to do those things, those principles in terms of competencies, and I think Louise is going to talk a little bit about that now. The last step. The last step. <laughs> and I recognise we're going into coffee time, which is very punishing. So and that there's no room for fault, punishment. Was it? <laughs> I think it was dark. <laughs> um, biggest elephant of all, leaving behind the status quo is not a question of tweaking the system. The desire to build capacity has been um, at the heart of UK policy for several decades, but. Um, um, Dave Allen in the, the fourth paper in the special edition sort of suggests that whilst achieving behavior change has been demonstrated at an individual level um, within the literature, within the research literature, being able to implement and sustain behavioral support um, to the volume required to meet the challenge here in the UK for, of challenging behavior um, is something that, that historically PBS has failed to deliver. A seismic shift is needed to get us from A, which is where we are now, to where we're going to get to. Um, issues such as the, the fact that we're still steeped in that medical model, um, not in the sort of more psycho, psycho, is it psychosocial, psychological social, psychosocial, psycho -social. Psycho -social <laughs> model that, that Hastings et al. have put together. That, that, that understanding, that conceptual model of understanding challenging behavior is not yet underlining, uh, underlying our approach to intervention. Workforce training and development is patchy. Um, there are courses, as, as Carl was saying, there are, there are um, courses in applied behavior analysis. There are courses in positive behavior support. Um, but we lack yet a coherent um, nationwide set of accredited courses in positive behavior support. 
Um, but courses aren't all that it's about, because we know that teaching doesn't necessarily lead to increased competence. And so not only do we need a teaching, but we also need a complete change, overhaul in the way that service, service um, structures or services are structured and service delivery is done so that we get the appropriate supervision and mentoring and support um, to be able to, in terms of staff development. Um, and there's also, I would argue, a lack of understanding of that definition of what PBS is at senior strategic levels. So having defined PBS, which is as we, we sort of identified that, that group of academics that got together last year and sort of said, okay, what are the problems? So they've mapped out some of the, some of the issues in this. Um, where do we go from here? And the next challenge really is to communicate it to <coughs> as wide an audience as possible and also to all levels within service delivery. Um, we need, we've said quality training and staff development, um, opportunities to, for staff progression, um, clearly defined sets of skills of knowledge, skills and knowledge, and it's really interesting. The the person who made that comment of, of PBS is, it's you know, it's it's when you don't see something, it's really really hard to define that, because uh, and and it chimes also with with what Vivian was saying about you know good quality provision is just you don't notice it because it's just normal. It's just what we expect. So trying to put that into defining those skills and so on is is hard um, and but and then also that making sure that that same set of however you define it is used to evaluate provision is used to um, to um, to help commission providers and so on and one way of and also getting consistent practice from a, from for research and one way to do that is to map everything all of those bits onto um, common competence onto a, a competence framework, <coughs> which kind of s defines, if you like, the contribution of our field to the question of how do you support individuals with challenging behavior. Um, so um, one way is to sort of define those competencies and then to get all of that mapped, the, the workforce training and development mapped onto that common core. Accreditation and professional recognition, which is what Carl was talking about, that the BACB has done very successfully for the US and increasingly international. We are not, I don't think, with the best will in the world, going to get the NHS to support everybody going through an American-based system. Um, I think, as Carl said, the point is to try and learn from what has been done elsewhere and try and do it for us here in a way that we're going to be able to um, to develop it, to roll it out, and to and to regulate in it, to have professional uh, recognition and regulation of our own services. And then the next bit is is once we have done that, is sort of is scaling up through research and evidence-based practice, and sort of some of the case studies that have been presented today are part of that. It's really important that we start to disseminate good practice because there is a lot of good practice out there and it's important that people get to hear about it. So, the sort of first bit in that is the defining competencies bit, and that's the bit that I've been very sort of um, involved in. In your packs, because I don't expect you to read all of this, you've got a copy of um, a sort of summary framework of where we've got to with the um, competence um, framework development. We are a group of individuals who are doing this in our own time, um, but we've had the benefit of some, a small amount of funding from Skills for Care to cover meetings and travel costs and things like that. Um, we worked on this yesterday, so this is now out of date because there are going to be some slight changes to some of the headings in here. But just to give you, an, and that this was the kind of work that I was hoping to present as a, I was planning to present as, as part of a workshop, but um, I am doing, we are doing sort of other workshops and so on. So as I say, if you want to be involved in that, that process, please um, do get in touch with me. Um, so we're sort of back to, um, oh, so I just want, sorry, just going back to that, just to say that 
in terms of the um, our sort of underlying assumptions for this piece of work is that competent staff will lead to better levels of care um, for service users. Competencies need to be grounded in that underlying conceptual framework, so the, the sort of it's embedded the um, work that, that Carl has just presented that Richard Hastings et al, uh, that model is embedded in this. Um, individual system and system-wide competencies are sort of an integral part of service provision. Um, we're defining competencies in terms of the knowledge, all of the things that anybody working to support individuals with um, behavior that challenges needs to know and what they need to do. So what we need to see them actually doing. Uh, so that's the, that's the slippery bit that we're trying to do, the how do you define what they're doing so that it doesn't look as if they're doing anything, kind of. Um, and the other, the other really important piece is that this is a joined up piece of work. There's lots and lots of people talking about PBS. There's lots of conferences going on. There's lots of different initiatives and so on. Um, we're not precious about this. We're not sort of taking you know, sort of ownership of it, only ownership of it in the sense of trying to, to take it forward. And we are really, really open to people contributing, participating, disseminating, telling us other ways that we should be doing this. Thank you very much.